Good evening. Watch me struggle through an interview tonight on a topic with which I am not um, really qualified to deal, by, although I understand it, I think, and I shall do my best, therefore. But first, here's Ted with the rundown. Tonight on Webster, from the depression of the dirty 30s to the Tory troubles of the 80s, the NDP have always placed third in our two-party system. Now they're in second place, but can they stay there? Webster finds out tonight from Ontario NDP MP, Lynn Greenwood. Government subsidized child care for all Canadians to the tune of $700 million. Will it be enough? Webster asks Rosh Belcher, child care task force member and conservative MP for Fraser Valley East. But first, 52% of the Canadian population are women, so why aren't they equally represented in the media? Advertisements, newsreaders, reporters, the list goes on, and they are all heavily weighted in favor of males. In the studio with Webster, Samantha Sanderson from Media Watch on the old fashioned views of this high tech industry. I hope I'm not the old fashioned views of this high tech industry, but Samantha Sanderson is the executive director of a government financed organization called Media Watch. Right. Which media do you watch? Well, we, the mass media, so that, that means not just broadcasting, um, but print as well, magazines and the newspaper. And you just, I've got the CRTC policy statement here on sex role stereotyping in the broadcast media. Well, I've seen a number of changes in sex role stereotyping, but what do you want? Perhaps that's the best way for me to tackle this topic. What does Media Watch want and does the government support you? Oh. Well, we, I can, perhaps I can back up where we started with what we wanted was the, we were concerned about the image of women. That's changed now and while we're still concerned about the image of women, we've moved to the point of being, of focusing both on employment of women, that is the real numbers both on and off the screen, and uh, the issue of equality of access to the means of communication for women. Are you objecting to the fact that uh, there are not enough female faces on television, be it in drama, commercials, or public affairs. That's right, not enough is, is one aspect of it, and certainly that's true. The, the numbers are not reflective of the numbers of women in the workforce. Also the roles that they play in those places, also off screen. That's where the really uh, significant differences are. Um, in terms of positions of power in the broadcasting industry, women are non-existent. So therefore you want an arbitrary proportion, as happens sometimes in the federal civil service on the proportion of senior officials who speak French and English, 27% to 73%, you want that arbitrarily applied to the broadcast media? No. No, we aren't suggesting any kind of arbitrary application. What we're always looking at is progress and how to continue to pressure um, broadcasters to continue in a, a progressive way to increase the numbers of women and to increase the places that those women are. All right, what to you, what can you tell me is the image of women as pro portrayed by the broadcast media this very day? Well, w one place you can see it where, where the impact is really um, uh, one of concern and that is in news and public affairs where examples 91 percent of experts um, in a study done a couple of years ago were male where 77 percent of uh, news hosts are male and 79 percent of reporters are male. That may have represented at that time the chosen expertise necessary to do the job properly for that particular broadcaster. Am I not correct in that simple logical assumption? No, I'm talking about, this was a content analysis of all Canadian programming, of all Canadian news programming. This is across the board. It isn't any one particular show, station, or day. It, it's, it's actually a, a very broad test. And that's what the statistics show. And there's every, the indications are that it hasn't changed significantly over the last two years. But I noticed, for instance, that in the figures, I think from your report, that you even complain about drama, where mm -hmm. males outnumber females, kind of 78% male to 22% female. 
something in those numbers. That's right. Major characters, for instance. So therefore, time. you've got to rewrite the drama of the male, uh, the drama and the characters to meet your arbitrary requirements. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think it, firstly, I don't think it's arbitrary to suggest that where you have a population that's 51% of one category, that, that that should be fairly reflected in something as powerful as television, which really sort of sets the parameters of, of people's worldview. And so what, what's happening when you don't have a fair representation, both in terms of numbers and importance, is that there is an implicit message that women are less important. And, and that's what we're fighting. And the implicit message, therefore, said he, thinking very quickly, is that no male, or a preponderance of males who are so prevalent, that they cannot address women's needs and concerns. Is that, that's the point you make? That's enough. You're suggesting, yeah. for instance, that I am not capable of talking about women's needs and concerns. God knows I've done thousands of programs on women's needs and concerns. Well, you, I think, probably are not totally typical. But on the other I'm hand... I'm certainly more than just a pretty face. You are indeed. Mm -hmm. And that too, mind you. No, no, that's a sexist remark, and I will not take a compliment that I am a pretty face. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I was only trying to stop you in mid-sentence there. Now, where do we go from but there? I, well, I, I, I would just want to follow up on that point about perspective and, and whether or not you can speak for women. Well, it's certainly true that, that either sex can deal with issues that may focus on one or the other. The reality in bro broadcasting is that the women's perspective is not <coughs> heard mm -hmm. at all. So what we're really looking at is a situation where 51% of the population has, does not have access to communicate their perspective, and it is different. Do you want the obligations? I know the CRTC report makes recommendations, and the CIB has some commitments too, and the CBC, but you want your oblig the obligations of broadcasters and advertisers entrenched in the Broadcasting Act. Well, two things. One, we have succeeded recently in, in one of the things that we had wanted, and that is that the CRTC would regulate. Um, broadcasters and now indeed broadcasters must comply with conditions of license or rather with uh, guidelines on sexual stereotyping um, a as a condition of license so they will be assessed every five years on that basis and the public probably doesn't know a lot about this but the public in fact can can s complain or comment and say who's doing well and who isn't then the other thing we want is something in the new broadcasting act which raises equality to the same level as freedom of expression. Equality. Equality in numbers. Equality of access in this case. Um, equality of representation. So that women are treated with e equal dignity to men. So that, so that people of, of other races are treated with equal dignity. Now you'll forgive me if I had a little laugh at some of the examples in the, in the matter of fact that's uh, uh, in, in the CRTC stereotyping book in which it would be wrong to it be correct to avoid offensive or patronizing language and tokenism. You're not supposed to say the little lady. Who last said the little <laughs> lady referring to the wife? I hope no one has dared. What should one say instead is the, the little lady? Well, it would depend on the circumstances. Uh, I if one was referring to someone's wife, then you would either use, either use her name or You'd her say the, the, the woman wife or the husband. Or the spouse. Or the, right, sure. Oh, another one here, men's team and girls' team. That's wrong. That should be men's team and women's teams. They're simple. That's simple. It's so simple that it's really kind of silly to put it in the book, is it not? No, because it, it literally it is a question of education. Largely, it's habit. People simply get into bad habits and, and they don't think about it. But as I mentioned earlier, this, in fact, is an area where there has been significant improvement in broadcasting, not... I might add in print. Even oh, because you can't do anything about print. Aha, uh -huh. that, that probably is one of the reasons. I mean, you have no legal access to go to a newspaper publisher and say, hey, we'll get after your license unless you do what we tell you. Absolutely. And it's an argument for being able to do it because there has been change. Here's one I disagree with. Instead of mankind, what is one supposed to say? Humanity. Doesn't mean the same thing. What's the difference? Humanity is a condition. Oh, human beings is, is the other one. The human race of people, name the profession. 
Uh, that's what it says here now. So therefore, you want people to, comp oh no, I was going to talk to you about advertising. Women themselves become sex objects on television, right? Willingly and freely. I'm talking about commercial advertising. Do you object to the representation of nothing but the slimmest, most beautiful, desirable women on television? We do very much, just uh, both, both in terms of, of size and shape and age and also race, that there's no representation virtually of people of other than the white race. And yet our, our, the population of Canada, of course, is, is very different than what you would believe if you saw the television. So yes, we, we very much object to that. Would I be correct to sum up your feelings by saying that the constant portrayal of more prominent males than females complains an implicit message that brainwashes women, I hate that word females, uh, into being less important than men. True. Because females is not a good word, is it? Well, that's an interesting example of how sexism works. Why wouldn't it be a good word? It, the only reason it doesn't it sounds, sound like a good word sounds, is because it's been used negatively so much. Oh, male and female both sound like clinical descriptions, don't they? I don't think the reaction to male is the same usually as the reaction to female. It's an interesting aspect of how sexism works. So you want it to, uh, it to be a condition of licensed broadcasting that broadcasters of all shapes and sizes are committed to guidelines which do not, in, which express the equality between men and women at all times. Well, they, what they, they do is require progress in this area. And they also are going to have methods of actually measuring whether or not that progress is taking place. Are you happy with the progress? Not yet, no. Has there not been a lot of improvement made? On, not yet on screen, there is progress but not nearly the progress we'd like to see. But in the last year, we are significantly making progress behind the scenes, which will affect what, what we see on screen. Okay, and you want to hear from the public on this too, don't you? Very much. And here is Samantha Sanderson, Executive Director of the Media Watch, whose headquarters are in Toronto? Certainly not in Vancouver. Shouldn't you be in Toronto? Well, that's another... More media to watch? Another stereotype we're breaking. A national office can thrive in Vancouver. After the break. Samantha Sanderson of Media Watch on sex role stereotyping in all media. Yes. Mm. Go ahead to Samantha. Hello? Yep. Hi, I'd like to ask uh, your guest, what would be the, uh, what would hold back people from uh, the Sikhs, the Germans, so on and so forth, from uh, demanding the same right? Nothing. Well, if we have so many Germans in Canada, why, why can't they say, uh, you know, we want to be represented equally on television? We have so many Sikhs, why oh, can't yeah. they be represented uh, equally? Uh, well, Every so group can say, claim the same right. It, well, that's right, and, and certainly that's, that's what we would like to see. Certainly in relation to the, the reality of the population, that that's what would make sense is if we had a representation and perspective of a true mix of, of, of our population. Well, what does that do then for the people that do the job best? If, if the people that do the job best happen to be all Sikhs or all whites or whatever, then that should be the way it is. We don't want to defeat the fact that the person that does the best job should do that job. and This would defeat that. Well, I don't, I don't know that I agree it would, it would defeat anything. I think that it's simply, we're talking about availability, and that means changing perspectives. Equal access and changing traditional patterns. But he did make a good point, I think. Go ahead, please. Um, yes, my pet peeve is I've noticed there's a lot of male reporters, like on CBC, that are overweight and unattractive, and yet I have never seen an overweight female reporter on CBC. You mustn't talk about Mike Duffy like that. <laughs> well, that's who I think. Like, if, if he were a woman, he wouldn't have his job on TV. Uh, I don't know. If there were a woman of the same proportion who was as bright as Mike, she, would, she might well have a parallel job. I have to disagree. I think the limitations on, on women's appearance in uh, television is appalling, and, and it's quite, it is a reality that women have to fit within a very, very small um, area of conventional appearance. Do you think so? Yes. Oh, I don't think that's necessarily so in Canada. I think if, if one just picks a, took a look, television, it would be confirmed. Go ahead, please. 
Hi, Rester, I agree with you. I, I don't think that um, that happens in Canada as much as maybe in the States. Also, I'd much rather look at a, an attractive or sexy woman because it makes me feel better that that's how men see us. And I also really don't mind being in a girls' team or being called mankind as opposed to being in a women's team. And being called humanity. Yes, and being called humanity. I mean, I, mankind, fine. Man is this as a whole. I mean, we've known that for years, and, and that's never bothered anybody before, I don't think. Thank you. You lost one there. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, Jack. Um, I'm just wondering, under these new CRTC guidelines, um, does it mean that shows like George Burns and Gracie Allen, for example, well, we won't be seeing them anymore. They represent the woman as a bit of a dunderhead, etc. cetera. Um, if I just see a big brother element coming in here that's very dangerous. Well, I think the, the concern about specific programming is, is not a real one because what we're talking about is not specific programming where, where we zoom in on a program and say that's not okay. We're talking about broad general numbers. We're talking about... You're talking about more about news, public affairs, and commercials. Well, no, we're talking drama just as much, but on an well, overall basis... I love Lucy would drive you around the bend now, well, wouldn't it? Well, it certainly would. Or but Jackie Gleason. Uh, that's a particularly Some of the funniest ones, one. the funniest <laughs> programs ever done. Well, it depends. Can't we look back nostalgically and say that's how we were then, ha, ha, ha? I think you, if you look back, you probably wouldn't laugh anymore. I saw a Jackie Gleason rerun the other night and I thought it was hysterical. Shame on you. Why? I refuse to accept that shame on me. I know it's an old program. I know the attitudes have changed. And he was the idiot in the program, and she always won the battle. Go ahead, please. Well, I think it's a load of cards about Wallop. It's a pity she hasn't something better to do. That's me. That's you. Meant. Yes, it's you. Go ahead, please. You know, there's one thing I want to tell this lady. I love watching Lucy. <laughs> I love all those women comedies. I think they're terrific comedians. And anybody who can watch that and think it's sexist is sick in the head. Uh, and besides, the women on TV reading the news or on radio should take voice training. Their voices come across like little babies. Thank you, ma'am. That's not quite fair. There was a time, 20 years ago, when you had very few women's voices. There are some excellent women broadcasters. It's well. an interesting thing I might just quickly say about voices. A lot of the high-pitchedness high, high -pitchedness for women is fear. And as, as they become more used to, being in the public. I got news for you. That happens sure. to old time broadcasters like myself. If you're uptight, your throat tightens, it, right. your voice rises two octaves. Yeah. Go ahead from 100 Mile House. Uh, yes, Mr. Ruster, good evening. Good evening. I was uh, wondering, would your uh, interviewer be offended to uh, such a show as uh, All in the Family, where Mrs. Bunker always is uh, portrayed as stupid and ignorant, but she always seems to bring Archie around to the fact where you know, he's he's taught a lesson by Mrs. Bunker. When well, we've had that a couple of times already. I found that program myself kind of offensive at times, even though I'm supposed to look mm -hmm. like Archie Bunker. Yeah, again, I have to say that what we're concerned about is the volume of repeating an image over and over and over, not a specific Good. program. Go ahead, please. Hello, I'm very glad that Media Watch is there to go to bat for women. And I have sent in complaints in the past about very sexist, um, advertising and Media Watch has gone to bat for me with good results and I'd like to congratulate them for doing such a good job. Thank you very much. Go ahead please. Hello. Where are you? You're not there I don't think. Are you there? No you're not. Go ahead please. Jack, how many women are deputy ministers for example? Very few. And they're the permanent, they're the permanent employees. They carry all the weight. Are you talking federal or provincial? It doesn't matter, Jack. They just don't get in. And, 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 and I'm, I know damn well that that's a spot where ability should be more important than anything else, regardless of sex. Fair enough? Fair enough. You haven't looked at political appointments. Well, yes, in fact, one of the things we are lobbying for, well, which is, the result, is, is more women on, for instance, the board of the CBC and on the CRTC, we're, we've been pushing for a long time for that, and they still aren't represented. A, a new woman, woman member from Quebec on the Supreme Court of Canada the other day. That was very that. good news. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to know what the uh, uh, background of the woman, your guest is, and I'd also like to know what her attitude is towards she mentioned earlier the 
feelings that across the way people, women were stereotyped in the news and television. I'd like to know if she feels it's wrong for a woman to be stereotyped as a housewife, uh, mother, family, family oriented person or not. And why is it that all these women have to be stereotyped as career wise, et cetera, et cetera? Well, I think the response to the last part of that is is that we um, are all for variety, and that includes women as housewives very much. So, what we're talking about is not only is not having only that stereotype. We want the whole cross section of what women do. So, certainly, of course, uh, women as, as housewives are an important. If there's a wa if washing machine commercial, the man should do the washing as often as the woman does, right? Is that correct? That's fair enough. I see that happening all the yeah. time. And it happens all the time in real life, too, as a matter of fact. That's right. Well, I, well, I don't see too much of the stereotyping of the women. Were you in the media, Samantha? No, my background is law. I'm a lawyer in communications. Thank you. Go ahead from Victoria. Yes, good afternoon, Jack. Question of your guest. Um, I'm a journalist and editor of 20 years. Some concern that um, she wants a big brother, sorry, make that big sister, to look into the print media as well and to look over our shoulders. Could she expand upon that, please? Uh, that's not, in fact, I don't think I, I said anything specifically on that point. We do, we are concerned and do watch the image of women and for sexual stereotyping in print, just as we do in broadcasting. Um, and we are equally concerned where ex consistent stereotyping demeans women or again conveys the message that women are less intelligent, less um, important. Yeah, but as I said earlier on, you can't really go to newspapers except with a request for them to change their attitude. That's right, and our, our process is more there, one of public education. Last call. Go ahead, please. Good afternoon. A few years ago, CBC French station hired a woman who did the um, news, um, how do you say, um, the weather. On the French, her name was Jocelyne Blouin, and she was very overweight, and she was what you would call a granola person. And oh, she's I don't like that. You see, I'm, I'm going to kill that call because that might be insulting to the woman, and I'm not going to use the call. Now, well, am, I right, Jack, am I wrong? Uh, yes, you are wrong. I don't think it's a bit over uh, insulting to say when so someone's overweight. But I don't overweight. know the woman, and I don't want the description of somebody given of which I don't know the facts. Well, I think, I, I think it's okay. Well, I've been doing this longer than you. I know I'm late on that one. Ah, okay. If you want to talk to Media Watch in Vancouver, there's a very easily remembered telephone number. 666-2111. That's not our phone number. That's what it says here. That's not Media Watch. Well, that's the CRTC. Well, that's a good, that's a very important phone number for everyone to have. What's your number? They can certainly call them. Ours is 731-0457. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Samantha. Did my best to understand and show my tolerance, understanding, and improvement with the years. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Talking about daycare next, too, about which, of course, I can know nothing after the break. <laughs> Conservative government in Ottawa is talking about unveiling its plan for improved daycare by June the 30th of this year. Ross Belcher, MP for Fraser Valley East, we got it right? Right. Was on the task force. Now, I know what the NDP want. The NDP want universal, fully financed, non-profit daycare for the more than two million children in need of quality care in Canada today. Are you going to match their offer? No. Nope. Their promise, I should say. Not at all. What is the Tory recommendation? What, our, what we recommended to the government is that in addressing the needs of children in, in all situations is that we have to, we have to do something. And so we've, we've divided into two ways. We're, we're going to the families, to money for the, to the families, directly to the families, mm -hmm. and we're also putting money into the system to, uh, uh, for the provinces to work with, with the federal government and uh, thus grow more daycare spaces than what we now have. You're trying to look for the provincial federal agreement on financing some extra daycare, but not very much. Well, some uh, like right now in licensed in licensed daycare, there are something in, in excess of 200,000 licensed spaces in Canada. Right. Uh, if the take up of what we're recommending were to come about with each of the provinces, that would in, that would increase at least another hundred thousand spaces. 
So you think 300,000 spaces, if all the provinces agree. If the provinces don't agree with your plan, you will not participate in any province without their agreement. We, we won't go into the daycare system ahead of the provinces because of the simple fact that the children and daycare is a provincial matter. It's not a federal matter. That's the way Confederation was put together, and we had to be very cognizant of that as we were putting our report together. So despite your $30 billion or $32 billion deficit or whatever it is, how much money are you prepared, do you think, to put into daycare cooperation with the provincial governments? Well, right now, the total of our recommendations would, would run in the order of about $700 million per year. Uh, 400 million of that, though, would be going to the parents by way of either a tax credit or if they have receipts, uh, by way of a, an expense credit uh, on their income tax. In other words, if you employ the woman next door and you don't get a receipt, which means the woman next door does not report it as income, you're aware of that hole yes. in the law, you're not. And so you're going to put the Nelson touch on that particular hole in the law. You will give her her share of tax credits per child. Yes. Have you any idea what the allowance per child would be? Well, we've recommended that that be on the order of $200 per year for a ch children under six years of age, and $100 for the second child, and $50 each for each additional child. So a woman with three children will get two, three, four hundred dollar tax credit. Yes. Right. A, whether or not she had bought the service. That's right, she doesn't have to have receipts. And if she buys the service, uh, and it's more than that, does she get more from you? If she buys the service and has receipts, then she can claim up to 30% of, of up to, of $3,000 per child. That's a $900 or per child. Per child. If she has the up, receipts. Yes. Now, a, something else. Operating grants. Are you prepared to give any money for operating grants to non-profit and profit-making daycare? Well, there was a real real concern with people that were coming before us of, that we would go one, you know, all one direction and only say to the non-profit. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, but there were as a goodly number of the provinces asked us to please not uh, make that make that stipulation. And so we are leaving it. As long as it's a licensed space, then the money is available for that licensed space. And then, so if the province has licensed the, the space, whether it be private, uh, private daycare, or, or non-profit, uh, it can be used. Uh, that sticks in the throat a little bit, doesn't it? That means that people who have the money, a couple of lawyers there, a couple of well-paid uh, people with children, are going to have an advantage in that they're private profit daycare place is also going to get the subsidy. Well, it, the facts though, Jack, when we were running, going across the country was that we found a goodly number of people had started up a daycare like a family daycare mm -hmm. so that they could look after not only their own children but take in four or five other children and, and charge for it. Mm -hmm. And that, I see no problem with that as long as it's licensed by, by the provincial authority, so that it meets minimum the, meets the minimum standards that will be that should be set in, in place. There's no reason why they should not be able to participate. And you would not, of course, take part in the li licensing or inspection no. of these uh, freshly federally government subsidized daycare centers. Those are those are the licensing is purely a provincial matter. Are you planning to give any operating grants yourself? Yes, to the profit and non-profit daycare centers. Yes, the operating grants uh, <coughs> will put in three dollars a day for uh, children under two, mm -hmm. two dollars per day for preschool children, mm -hmm. and fifty cents a day for after, sc after school children. For after school children. What about parental leave benefits? Did I not remember something in your report about a recommendation, and was this recommendation not unanimous among all the reports. Yes, we've recommended that the two-week waiting period that is now in place for to get the parental leave, that be waived in 1987, and then additionally that uh, two weeks per year be added to it till it reaches 26 weeks. Mm -hmm. But also, in, in addition to that, we have, we have said that if one of the parents remain at home in that time, that the, the, male, the male or the female can qualify for that, one of the parents. It's not just to the, to the mother. My, how times have changed in the Conservative Party. 
Well, it's a case Jake of... Jacob, of course, believes that the children are best looked after by mothers at home regardless. Well, no, I think you'll find that Jake Epps said that the, the children are best looked after by one of the parents. At home. At home. Now, the that, that, But more importantly, he also, in that same context, said that that was in reply to a question as to whether daycare was the best for children. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, you've been quite sharply attacked by the NDP on this as a plan which is more damaging than no plan at all. Well, not at all. The NDP, of course, uh, have a very narrow focus of what they would do. They say there are two, mil two million children. We, th they fail to real they fail to tell the people that yeah. there are uh, a one point uh, over a million children in school of that two million people, uh, and they and they're going to have daycare systems in in place for to accommodate all of them in that. There, it, that's not that's not needed, or nor is it necessary. And the people are, of Canada are saying. Don't just go and, and put in a system that we'll be forced to, to, to send our children to. Uh, pay, some, pay some attention to what, our, what the needs are, but more importantly, also be fiscally responsible. Oh, just by the way, oh no. Yes, I've got to ask you this. Finish that section. Are you fought out against capital punishment? If the opportunity comes, I will vote for it. I, I was nominated on that basis, and then I have since checked with the, with my writing with the writing itself, and uh, over 4,000 people wrote me and said yes. I don't want calls to Mr. Belshot on capital punishment, but I'll always like to ask every MP who appears how he stands on it. So calls on the Tory plan for daycare now after the break. <laughs> First call to Ross Belshutter is Penny Coates of the BC Daycare Action Coalition. Go ahead, Penny. Thank you very much. I'd just like to commend the committee on recognizing that there is a real problem and that there's a role for the federal government to play. However, I'd like to challenge Mr. Belcher on two of the recommendations in particular. He talks about a child care tax credit, money going to families and that being a providing more parental choice, and yet I would suggest that it at, works out to an increased net benefit per family of about $200 a year, and that that's a windfall for high income earners, but it does nothing to help the low and middle uh, income earner find accessible care, uh, find available care, uh, find affordable care. And had they in fact put that money directly into capital and startup uh, grants and operating grants, we could have created a, a further 60,000 spaces uh, this year alone. Okay, Ross. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Penny. I think what you have failed to realize or have not touched on there, Penny, is we were very careful on, on when we recommended how that money would be available through the tax system. And we said it would come through as a, a tax expense credit. Now, that $900, 30% uh, of, of 3000 that $900 is $900 for the 25000 a year person. It's $900 for the 75000 So don't tell me that it's more advantageous to the $75,000 well, as it is to the 25000 that they but it's not. It's a net increase of $200 over what we have in place right now and that um, it still does not provide daycare for the children who actually need it. It provides them with $200 later on in the year um, and yet the low and middle income may not be able to afford the upfront cost. Okay. Well, Penny, re remember that the low income, the low income person that is, that is that is already covered to a, to a great deal. The cap system is in place already. Uh, uh, can be used by by many of the people at the very low low income side, and the provinces are able to charge back 50 percent of that uh, to the federal government. Thanks, Penny. Go ahead, please. Good evening, Jack. I'd like to ask Mr. Belcher if he's ever heard of latchkey children, children who are of school age who go home to empty homes because one or both of their parents, if they have two parents, are working. Don't those children need a little supervision as well? I was a teacher's aide, and I can yes. guarantee you that a lot of them not only need it, but would love to have someone there for them when they're out of school and have to go home alone. Yes, we saw many examples of that as we went across the country, and also various organizations that have put uh, 
plans into place so that there's a, a place for the children to phone to uh, and, and also uh, for after school care that was put on in community centers and churches and so on. And there, there, is, a, there is a lot being done right now. But there, you're quite right, there still is a, a great many of latchkey children that go home to an empty home themselves. And you're not doing anything about them. That's right. I mean, those are the people that the NDP are talking about when they say two million children. They're okay. Not well, they're, they're a part of the two million. But the two million is all the children under 12 years of age. Go ahead from Vanman. Thank you very much. Mr. Belcher, I'm afraid that the policies that the government is looking at right now will be woefully inadequate to meet the needs of our society and our society as it grows. Change your mind. Sure. Uh, I think that uh, the, the system should be similar to public school education as it is now, except that it is extended backwards one or two years or as many necessary to see the needs that are coming. And it would be a minor increase in taxes overall and expenses to cover those. Well, it wouldn't, it, caller, it would not be minor. The Katie Cook Task Force uh, said that the, what they were recommending could cost up to $11 billion. I don't consider $11 billion a minor amount. Over what time period those $11 billion, sir? I beg your pardon? Over what time period? Well, that was when it was fully implemented, sir. Fully and implemented used, over what time period? And using 1984 dollars. Fully implemented by what time? That was by the year 2000, using 1984 dollars. Okay, from now till the year 2000, $11 billion. Per year. Per, ye per year, $11 billion, sir? Yes. Yes, the, 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 when, when you start thinking in terms of the numbers of what you were recommending, it is an astronomical sum of money. Thank you. We'll leave that one. Go ahead from Aldergrove. Yes, this, uh, it sounds to me like this is a universal daycare you're talking about. No. Am no. I right? No, no, that's not what we're recommending. All right. Well, I can see uh, daycare, especially for single working mothers, but uh, why should I or anyone else be asked to subsidize daycare for children of mid-income people? Well, you're, you're, only, <clears throat> you're only asked to, to subsidize it to the tune of the amount that what the government is, is putting in. We are not recommending a universal daycare system. Our 700 report, million, you're asking. 700 million in total. But some of that goes to the system and some of that goes to parents. Go, go ahead, please. Hello. Yep. I'm on a small pension, and I've raised three children without any freebies from the government, and I resent my taxes being increased to open up daycare centers. Why don't they, uh, if they have one parent at home, and give them some kind of a homemaker's salary? This would make more sense and be much better for the children. Well, you just want to remember that not all people want to remain at home. Many people want to have a choice as to whether they remain at home or not. Go ahead, please. Hello. That's you, ma'am. Yes, hello. Um, I'm on welfare, and I've got a child, and I am i don't have the choice of staying at home. I'm being forced to go to work, which I'm going to college. Now, I had a problem finding a daycare for my son at that time. He was a year old because nobody wanted a child under 18. How come? 18 months. 18 months. Nobody would take him. I had a terrible time. Don't know yes. you. No, I, I can w well imagine that would be difficult because... Uh, when a ch children under 18 months, they, I think they, they want a ratio of about one to three, a caretaker to about three people. There's nothing in here for kids of 18 months. There, there is some. In the provincial plans. In, in, in the provincial plans some and also places. recommended here. Go ahead, please. Yes, I'd like to make the point that I'm a middle income earner or was a middle income earner who earned $25,000 a year and uh, I uh, just had to quit my job because I have an eight-month-old child for whom I could not find adequate care and could not afford. I'd like Mr. Belcher to know that the cost of adequate care is somewhere upwards of $800 a month, and I was looking at $1,000 a month in the city to have adequate nanny care for my child in my home, and I had to quit my job. That's one-on-one -on -one nanny, though. That is a one-on-one. -on -one. That's yeah. only adequate care. That isn't even a trained nanny. That's just a, uh, a lady who would like to stay home with children. Well, I, no, nothing in this for nannies. Uh, for the care, they, they can qualify for the three, uh, for up to the three thousand dollars of receipts mm -hmm. that they have spent on caring of their children. And they get thirty percent of that. Thirty percent of that. Last call. Go ahead, please. Thanks, Jack. Mr. Belcher, I am a hundred percent in favor of daycare for people that need it. But as a single person, I just feel it's very unfair that I should subsidize other people so they can both work, have two incomes, and afford luxurious yeah. new cars. They can buy a home. A single person now can't even buy a home. 
uh, if you choose to get married, fine, then the wife can go out and work and they can get a home. But then they seem to want to have kids anyway, and fine, I have me pay to look after them. Okay, so you touch on a very, a very important part. I asked various witnesses that appeared before us. One was a university professor in Calgary, and uh, he was talking about daycare, and, and nobody was minimizing the need for daycare. But when I said, how do we address needs versus wants? so that we make sure that we are helping the people that need it. And he says, Mr. Belcher, he says, I wouldn't want to even get into that subject. And I said, well, listen, I said, we have to get into it. I mean, uh, we, have to, we have to think in terms of it. I was hoping you'd be able to give us at least one suggestion as to how we might address that. And uh, this caller has, has, has put his finger on, on that very real problem. It's one there. nasty crack unfairly at the end of the program. Certainly. You could have saved 300000 from the PC fund to put it into daycare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Jack, remember that half of that's been paid back already by the person that was going to use it. <laughs> but and it was deductible in somebody's hands. <laughs> and, and you forgot to also mention that that same fellow that was using it uh, took $15,000 cut in his salary, and nobody says thank you to him for it. Well, thank you anyway for giving Sir. me a response. Next, we're going to have one of your enemies, a feisty ndp -er who originally comes from the coast, I think, called We Misnamed Her in the Rundown. Let me just check her name. McDonald, Lynn McDonald. Lynn McDonald. Mm. After the break. <laughs> That's right. No, There's one political party in Canada which has an eternal halo round its pristine head. It claims that it started every single piece of social progress in this country of Canada. Guess is it, who? Does that annoy you? Well, we claim it, and I think there's, First an, of all, there's an element of truth in it, Jack. Lynn MacDonald, MP. Where's your constituency? Toronto, Broadview Greenwood. Originally a girl from New Westminster. Min That's right, New Westminster. New Westminster. And you've written a book, The Party That Changed Canada. Now, apart from our clean air and our beautiful soil, what did you not invent? Well... Oh, by the way, I'm going to take calls now to Lynn. We've only got okay. one segment. And if I, you know, run out of, not run out of steam, but don't get after her properly, please feel free to phone in. Okay, Lynn, start at the beginning. Okay. Uh, I'll pretend you're, the, you're a, an image of Tommy Douglas in different yes. form. Okay, well, my book is dedicated to Tommy Douglas, incidentally. To I, whom else would I, you dedicate I look, the book? He's a great hero of mine, and I think uh, did, a lot to, uh, did a lot for Canada. Well, I argue that Canada would not be the same country it is, had it not been for the CCF and the NDP. Obviously, other people helped, too, but we played a very important role in getting the social programs for Canada, old age pension, unemployment insurance, if uh, you ask Medicare, yeah. for example, mm -hmm. and uh, we are a more caring society, uh, I think a better society. We don't have the violence, we don't have the desperation that there used to be in the past. We don't have the desperation that you see in the States, for example. We've done things differently, and I think our party has had a share in making Canada different, and I think making Canada a better country. Trivia question, who was the founder of the CCF? Well, I would say J.S. Woodsworth, not alone, but certainly the first, and... Uh, who were the two famous Vancouver people who were still in the forefront of the battle when I came here in the 40s? In the 40s. Well, I wasn't uh, politically active. The McInneses. In the, oh, the McInneses. Oh, yes. And, uh, and Grace, Grace, of Grace is, McInnes is... Uh, still alive. Uh, it's still very... Well, still, still can make a very good speech, incidentally, uh -huh. and... Uh, of course, very active on and things like equality rights, which is another thing apart from the bread and butter issues, the idea that uh, there should be fairness in our society, there should be discrimination on the basis of race or religion. Those were radical ideas, Jack. We take them for granted now. But the old CCF NDP, they were called totalitarian for believing in equality rights. Would you believe it? Well, when, when was that? Oh, talk about, the, well, 1940s, for example, 1930s. Uh, Japanese Canadians, of course, Chinese Canadians not allowed the vote, and uh, uh, the CCF spoke against those things. Saskatchewan brought in the first Bill of Rights. They were called totalitarian under the Tommy Douglas Native government. Native Indians didn't have the votes when they, I came here in '47. Right. Didn't get it until about '49. They, indeed, indeed. But those things were fought for, and the CCF NDP was told you're visionary and this is unrealistic. All of those things were, but we fought for those things. Boy, now people agree. Now people agree. Now but you've who changed. Led the way? Now you've changed. Well, but Canada has changed, not we who have changed. But why Canada. not? You've changed too. You've changed too because you see Ed at the top of the polls in personality. 
you see yourself running high up in the polls and you think now we're going to lose all that old socialist fervor. No more nonsense about nationalization of anything at all. We're going to be mixed economy, small well, liberal free the enterprises. The 1980s are not the 1930s and a mixed economy is the only way to go. Everyone would agree with that. There's got to be localized job creation. There are different issues. Environmental pollution is a big issue of the 1980s. It wasn't in the 1930s. People didn't think about it. We don't talk about the issues of the 30s. Some of them have been solved. I mean, we do have unemployment insurance. We've got Medicare now. Why should we be going around beating the bush for issues that have been at least, uh, say, substantially solved? But with the Americans leaning on us so heavily about some of what they regard as our unfair social safety network, we may have to give in and back off our well, if, social network a if, little bit. If we have free trade with the United States, I think our social programs are at very serious risk. Are and you that's against one of the reasons. free trade with the United States? I, I am against free trade with the United States. We have, we, the United States is our biggest trading partner right now and probably will long remain so. But I think we should diversify more and we should not become more dependent on the Boy, country look how that's tough running us. Look how tough they've been on the Japanese imposing sanctions, wham, bam. Well, the Japanese are a very interesting example of protectionists who have a very healthy economy. You know? I mean, and they do it by building very strong look barriers what the until did. they become competitive. Look what they did, the Americans did to us on the 15% solution, or else. Well, uh, the Americans uh, want to have their cake and eat it too, and we have to fight back, but our economy is too much dominated. We've got to diversify and not be so dependent. We can't realistically have, have real free trade when you've got a multinational system, because you don't have competing decisions. You and look how you fitters. treat, no, first of all, Amoco. Amoco is in the lead to buy Dome, which is that great money losing Canadian enterprise. Surely the sensible thing to do is to let Amoco take over um, Dome, well, save the taxpayers billions and save well, 4,000 jobs in Alberta. That, but you know perfectly well that uh, there are bailouts of, of private companies that uh, uh, run into trouble. So uh, let's not be uh, so naive as to think they'd just be allowed to go belly up if they ran into problems. Look at how you're changing your attitude to Quebec. All of it, remember you used to be a totally unified party and you would do nothing which would endanger the structure of the country. And now it seems you're going along the way of kind of opening the door to a uh, constitutional amendment from Quebec which would give it well, freedom to separate. No, not freedom to separate. What we have favored, and I think it's eminently reasonable, is the rights that Quebec has now should not be taken away. There shouldn't be a step backward by being outvoted by the other provinces. Quebec, after all, is the only province with a majority of francophones. Mm -hmm. And they could be outvoted, obviously, by uh, the nine other little, provinces. Little nag uh, in 72, you won an election here in British Columbia, but you didn't last long, did you? We only lasted three years, alas. One of the reasons for my book is Canadians have not seen very much of the NDP in government. Canadians, by and large, so do sure. not know. They haven't seen us federally. And uh, Canadians do not know that uh, we've run governments in European countries. Sweden, for example, unemployment. I you were thrown out in Sweden. Oh, but we came back in. Norway. Because, what oh, about Norway? Well, we're back in in Norway. What I about mean, Denmark? Denmark has various coalition governments now. But Jack, I just want to make the point that we, ha we have run countries and run economies successfully and, and with my, good job creation. My thank to Lynn MacDonald, the, the party that changed Canada. Thank you, Lynn. After break. <laughs> Tomorrow we have a visit from Don Mazankowski, the Deputy Prime Minister of Canada, which should be interesting in this particular situation. Tomorrow I might put on this ambassador for space, the guy who's traveled everywhere. I like people like that. At 5 p.m. precisely.